Welcome to this tutorial, you guys. We're going to look at the steps that Canada took to become a free and independent nation. Uh, the timeline is from 1919 to 1931. Um, these events are likely to be on your provincial exam, so it's important that you know them. You can see there are two references. Your workbook is probably the better of the two references. First of all, let's talk about the Treaty of Versailles, the treaty that the Allies signed with Germany. Uh, this wasn't a treaty that the Germans had a chance to negotiate. This was basically a diktat, which means we told them the way things were going to be and they had to accept it. During the First World War, Canada had a population of about 8 million people. However, our army was over half a million in terms of the number of people who served. Uh, this is by far the largest proportional representation in the war of any of the dominions or the uh, other uh, countries uh, in the empire. Um, to put this into perspective, if we consider that war age uh, soldiers were between 19 and 45, and yes, many younger than 19 served, uh, that means that basically one in six Canadian males served in the army uh, during the First World War. Um, now, the Americans, for example, had a much larger army, 4.3 million, um, but they only had about twice as many killed as Canada. That means that if you were in the American army, you had a 1 in 34 chance of being killed. In the Canadian army, you had a 1 in 9 percent, uh, pardon me, a 1 in 9 chance of being killed. Uh, that means that proportionally, uh, Canada lost four times as many soldiers as the Americans did. And so when Robert Borden goes to Paris for the treaty talks, uh, he says to uh, the British Prime Minister Lloyd George that Canada has paid dearly, both in terms of lives lost and also in terms of dollars and also in terms of uh, other problems at home. We think, for example, of the conscription crisis. Now, the British had recognized Canada to some degree. Uh, Borden sat on the Imperial War Cabinet. General Curry, the uh, Corps commander by the end of the war, was treated uh, with very special status. He was treated more like an army commander than a Corps commander. And of course, the soldiers themselves had reached something like star status because of the exploits that they were able to achieve. Now, Borden argued that because of the Canadian Corps' exceptional war record, um, and of course because of our victories in places like Vimy and Passchendaele, but mostly because of the great sacrifice, Canada warranted a separate seat at the table. And you can see from the picture that, uh, that we got it. Uh, Robert Borden sitting uh, right at uh, the side next to the head table. So uh, a, a position of importance comp compared to some of the other participants. Now, the other event that you need to, to recognize is Chanuk in 1922. Uh, basically what happened, uh, uh, Turkey was dismantled, the Turkish Empire was dismantled at the end of the war, and uh, the British and the French occupied the Dardanelles Strait, which is the, uh, the area that is circled uh, leading between the Aegean Sea and the Black Sea. Um, the striped areas are zones of, of influence. The colored areas are, are ceded territory. So Greece, uh, Turkey's traditional enemy, got this territory here on, the, on either side of the straits. And uh, the leader that, uh, that emerged after the First World War in Turkey is a man named Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. He was a nationalist and he fought to get the foreigners out of Turkey. Uh, in 1922, he sent his soldiers to dislodge the Greeks, uh, and he was successful. However, the British and the French got panicky because they thought that he might carry on into uh, the zone uh, that they were in. And so Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister, calls for help. He calls to Canada. However, uh, unfortunately for him, Mackenzie King did not send troops unconditionally uh, in support of Great Britain this time. Um, he says, no, before we send troops, we're going to have to debate this in the House of Commons. And fortunately for Mackenzie King uh, and any possible soldiers, um, before that debate was over and before a vote could be taken, the crisis in Chanuk uh, was ended. Okay, next we have the Halibut Treaty. This occurred in 1923. Halibut fish stocks uh, were declining on the Pacific coast, and the Americans and the Canadians wanted to negotiate a treaty to manage the fish stocks. Now, Canada had not always been successful in her negotiations uh, with the Americans. Um, there were some boundary disputes that happened in the middle and late 1800s that uh, Canada lost, in essence. Uh, the British, uh, who were negotiating on our behalf, 
um, gave in to the Americans. Now, in some cases, they probably uh, settled things fairly. In other cases, uh, many Canadians feel that Canada sold out, um, uh, pardon me, Great Britain sold out Canada in order to appease the Americans and get on the Americans' good side after the uh, American War of Independence, which had occurred about 100 years earlier. So in 1923, um, a joint management uh, model was, uh, was agreed upon. Um, the Halibut Commission was formed and uh, Canada signed the treaty with the Americans, um, independent of Great Britain. So that means that the, uh, the British Prime Minister in Washington did not sign the treaty. Um, now, it was a moot point because the American Senate ended up not ratifying the treaty. However, the commission carried on. Um, this is important because it shows, uh, once again, that Canada is going to do what it has to do in order to get its way. This next one is very important. You need to know about the King Bing Affair. Uh, in 1925, um, after the election, we find that the Liberal Party under uh, Mackenzie King um, did not continue um, with legitimate power. Okay, They only had 101 seats. The Conservatives had 116. Now, from our study of politics, we know that the Conservative Party should have formed the, the new government under Arthur Meehan. However, the Progressive Party told Mackenzie King that it would pledge its support to the Liberals, and so Mackenzie King refused to resign being Prime Minister. And of course, because he had the support of um, the progressives, in essence, he had created something like a union government. And uh, so the governor general had to allow him to become prime minister. And he did. And then in 1926, uh, there was a political scandal and the progressives withdrew their support from Mackenzie King. Mackenzie King, fearing that there would be a vote of non-confidence in the House, goes to the governor general and asks for a new election. However, Lord Bing says, uh, no, I won't give you a new election. The Conservatives have more seats than you. I'm going to offer Arthur Meehan the chance to form a government, and Arthur Meehan does, in fact, form the government. That government falls in short order, and a new election is called this time, and Mackenzie King, running on a campaign that he's supporting uh, Canadian autonomy against uh, the British, uh, wins a majority government, and it would seem that the will of the people are with Mackenzie King. It's important to remember that uh, Lord Bing was a popular figure in Canada. Uh, we might look at him um, 75 years later and say, oh, that Brit was trying to control Canada. But uh, because of his leadership at Vimy Ridge and, uh, and uh, his general popularity in Canada, uh, people at the time didn't necessarily see him as the evil one. Uh, however, it was recognized that this was the first time a governor general had refused the will of the prime minister. And uh, this was important not only in Canada, but in the rest of the empire. And um, we'll see in our next, uh, in our next uh, event here that um, it, it is important in the rest of the empire. So this is uh, a landmark event. Remember, a landmark event is an event that uh, changes the landscape politically. And uh, this did set a new precedent. It, uh, it um, gave primacy of power to the prime minister in Canada. And so there is no doubt after this event that he is the de facto head of uh, the government, but also of the nation. Okay, so that happened in the summer of 26. In uh, the winter of 1926, there's an imperial conference. These conferences would occur in London about every four years. The leaders of the dominions would meet with the British government and they would discuss the policies and, and politics of the empire. Um, at this conference, uh, a former prime minister by the name of Lord Balfour gave a report uh, that basically indicated that um, the dominions should become autonomous nation states. Okay, so they should not be subservient to uh, British, uh, the British government, that they should be equal to the British government. You can see the quotation here that the dominions are autonomous communities within the British Empire, equal in status and in no way subordinate. Okay, so a lot of people say that uh, the Balfour Report turns Canada from a colony to a nation. Now, the Balfour Report is, uh, is put into law in 1931 uh, by the British Act of Parliament, the Statute of Westminster. Uh, it's interesting that this, uh, this act uh, affected the Canadian government, but not necessarily the provincial governments. And, and because uh, we didn't have our own constitution and this statute did not override the BNA Act, uh, there was still a link between provincial law and the British government. And that's not because the British wanted it that way. It's because the Canadian provinces couldn't agree on a new constitution. This, of course, changed under Pierre Trudeau in 1982 with the uh, passage of the Canada Act. 
So the Statute of Westminster then, 1931, is the de facto and immediate independence of Canada. So from this point on, Canada is, for all intents and purposes, a free nation. So uh, just to review the dates then, uh, 1919, 1922, 1923, a couple of events in 1926 and 1931. I put some images on the right-hand side of the screen to help you try to remember what these different events were. So first, in 1919, we have the Treaty of Versailles. In 1922, the Chanak Crisis, where the British Prime Minister asks for Canadian troops. In 1923, the Halibut Treaty signed between Canada and the U.S. without a British ambassador's signature. In 1926, the King Bing Affair, where the Governor General refuses a request of the Prime Minister. In 1926, Lord Balfour, Lord Balfour pardon me, uh, at the Imperial Conference uh, indicates that the Dominion should be made free in autonomous states. And then in 1931, the first of the Dominions, Canada, is given that status 